Hello, I'm Lee Majors, and I'm really excited to bring you an inside look at the many wonders here at Yosemite National Park. Like many of you, I've taken my family to parks to hike and camp, but I'm especially thrilled to bring you to Yosemite, a place I've been coming to for years. Yosemite National Park, a jewel set in California's Sierra Nevadas. The natural wonders here draw more than four million people a year. Can this beauty survive into the future? Many national parks are struggling with this same question. We're gonna visit Yosemite and discover ways to enjoy the park while preserving the wild for generations to come. It makes sense to start here in Yosemite when looking for ways to protect while still using our parks. Back in 1864, before there were national parks, Abraham Lincoln set aside parts of what is now Yosemite to be preserved for future generations. This had never been done before. The United States government had never set aside wilderness for the betterment of its people. But when you take a closer look, you can see why President Lincoln was so impressed. Of all parts of the park, Yosemite Valley has the most natural wonders. At 350 stories high, El Capitan is the largest single rock on Earth. Yosemite Falls, with its three tiers, is the highest waterfall in North America. And Half Dome, probably the most famous site here is a huge granite dome split down the middle by a glacier millions of years ago. One of my favorites, Rydal Veil Falls, is named because the water looks and moves like a veil. The local Native Americans recognize something else. They call it Pahono, spirit of the puffing wind. This concentration of sights in the valley makes it possible to see the beauty of Yosemite in a short visit, as short as one day. But to really experience the park, I recommend that you stay much longer. Yosemite National Park covers 1,100 square miles with Yosemite Valley in the central area. Directly south is the Mariposa Grove, an area with hundreds of giant sequoia trees. In the north lies the majority of Yosemite's backcountry wilderness. In order to experience all of Yosemite, you need to spend at least a day in each area. There are several options if you want to remain overnight in the park. In the valley, you can stay in anything from a campsite to the five-star Awani Hotel. In the south, the Wawona Hotel is just five minutes from the Mariposa Grove. In the high country, there are several camping options. But remember, the availability of all lodging is limited. You should make reservations far in advance. Uh. Well, you know, when I'm here, I just can't wait to get up. No better way to start your day than breathing in that nice, fresh, clean air. Mm. Now, then you decide what you want to do and how you want to get there. See ya. Yosemite is a good place to be active in the outdoors. Biking in the valley is something anyone can do. You can bring your own or rent one here. But riding is restricted to paved trails to protect the soil. And don't worry, there are miles of bike trails throughout Yosemite, so you can still have a great ride. If you'd like to do a little hiking, there are plenty of paths around Yosemite. Decide what route to take by picking up a map at the visitor center. The terrain varies. Some of the walks are fairly easy and only take about an hour. Longer hikes with steeper terrain rise up from the valley into the back country. You decide how far you want to go. There are other kinds of tours to take around the valley. Since Yosemite attracts more than 200 species of birds, 
you can see many on an organized bird walk. Sign up at one of several locations in the valley. If you'd like a taste of Yosemite's past, take a walk to the Yosemite Pioneer Cemetery near Yosemite Village. Here, Native Americans and some of the park's first settlers are buried. You can explore the area anytime. For people looking for more strenuous exercise, look no further than Yosemite's granite walls. Anyone can try rock climbing here. There's terrain for all levels. A mountaineering school also offers classes. For a general introduction, spend half a day learning the ropes. While you're here, you'll notice people climbing El Capitan, but it's only for experts. The ascent takes several days, and climbers actually sleep in slings. It can be a lot of fun watching from below. Bring a good pair of binoculars. From this distance, the tiny climbers are almost impossible to see. Oh my gosh. Boy, would you look at that guy. It's gotta be nuts. Yosemite is open all four seasons. In the winter, some of the roads are closed and most activities are limited to the valley. Rangers lead snowshoe walks, or you can rent a pair and trek out on your own. Camp Curry, the oldest lodging area in the valley with tent cabins, has an ice skating rink. Bring your own skates or rent them here. Beginning in spring, all areas of the park open back up. To experience all that Yosemite has to offer, you can hit the high road. Leaving the valley floor, you have two choices. Head south of the valley toward Glacier Point to see some of Yosemite's incredible views, or go north to the high country. Even though parts of the high country are easy to reach, only half an hour by car, or you can catch a shuttle. When you get here, you'll feel like you've left the whole world behind. You won't see many folks up here either. In fact, only 10% of park visitors ever make the trip. They don't know what they're missing. This is a true wilderness experience, and it's within walking distance of your car. Here, you'll find beautiful meadows carpeted with spring blooms, a perfect place to picnic. One of the high country's most popular features is Tuolumne Meadows, the largest meadow in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The high country is dotted with lakes and streams, but I don't recommend swimming. The water comes from snow melt and stays incredibly cold year round. The high country is extremely vast and actually encompasses the majority of the park. The more adventurous can find trails for backpacking and hiking truly leaving civilization far behind. Camping in the wilderness is allowed with a permit. There are also campsites accessible by car and tent cabins available. What I enjoy most about being here is the perspective. You can see the back of Half Dome and really appreciate the setting in which it exists. Another high elevation area that will give you a great perspective is south of the valley, heading towards Glacier Point. Make sure you have plenty of film before leaving the valley. A 15-minute drive will take you to Tunnel View Overlook. The view from here has been called the most photographed vista on Earth. Through the tunnel and on up the road is Glacier Point. Here, you're 3,000 feet above the valley, shoulder to shoulder with Half Dome. Luckily, there's a rail. Earlier in the century, people could walk out on the point's overhanging rock and test their bravado. Pretty tough test. Continuing south toward the Mariposa Grove is the Pioneer History Center. Here you can get a first-hand experience of Yosemite's past by taking part in activities that recreate the lifestyles of some of the park's first settlers. The last major attraction that you'll want to allow time for is the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias. These few hundred trees, almost destroyed by logging, 
are what remain of 30,000 acres. The most famous grizzly giant stands over 200 feet tall and 32 feet wide, one of the oldest living things on Earth. At over 2,700 years, it was living here before the time of Christ. The magnificence of these trees played a major role in President Lincoln's decision to preserve Yosemite. When we come back, from petting zoos to big game hunters, a look at Yosemite's wild past. And now back to Yosemite, preserving the wild with Lee Majors. Yosemite National Park draws more and more people every year. With their greater numbers comes a greater impact on the environment. To ensure Yosemite's survival for future generations, we must learn from lessons in the past. The valley has been inhabited for thousands of years, most recently by the Awanichi people, a branch of the southern Sierra Miwoks. For 800 years, they maintained the balance of life in the valley, according to their own knowledge and traditions. But it was only a matter of time before a new people would discover the valley, and Yosemite's fate would be changed forever. You know, it was right here on this trail in the mid-1800s that a small military regiment crossed these mountains and came upon this valley. The report made it all the way back to the White House, President Lincoln. Lincoln was so impressed that he broke from his war duties and signed legislation protecting the area for public use and recreation, inalienable for all time. Being the first federally protected land, the fate of Yosemite was uncertain. Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of New York Central Park, became Yosemite's first overseer, assigned to carry out the goals of the law. Olmsted's vision was to leave the park in as natural a state as possible, providing only the bare necessities to visitors. During the same period, author and conservationist John Muir came to Yosemite. Inspired to keep Yosemite wild, he played an important role in creating the park. Muir's writings caught the attention of Teddy Roosevelt. Muir met Teddy Roosevelt here in 1903 and impressed him with the importance of protecting more land. Soon after, Roosevelt did in fact set aside additional areas of land, shaping the national park we know today. The creation of the park coincided with the development of a middle class. For the first time, large numbers of people had money to spend and were looking for new experiences. Traveling to Yosemite was an exciting adventure. To attract more people and accommodate their needs, the park developed more attractions, services, and conveniences for tourists. Yosemite even created a church. It now stands as the oldest surviving building in the park, still open to the public for Sunday services. As visitation grew, Accommodating tourists became more important than conservation. The park began to resemble a resort more than a national park that we would recognize. The firefall was created, a nighttime spectacular where burning embers were sent down a waterfall. In the 1930s, park officials realized Yosemite's wilderness and beauty were at risk. They began to change their management policies. The first change came in how they handled the park's wildlife. For years, professional hunters were hired to kill dangerous predators in order to protect tourists. Safer wildlife was used as entertainment. Yosemite even brought in other species of animals and created a zoo. Today, after years of management changes, we are able to experience Yosemite as nearly a wild environment. You can see animals acting as they do naturally. You don't have to go to a lot of trouble looking for them either. You might be driving down the road and a coyote will cross right in front of you. On a hike, you might notice a bear sleeping in a tree. Or you might see a family of deer come out of the forest to eat in the early morning. Officials began to see that not only would perceptions of the wildlife have to change, but also the way the whole park ecosystem was managed. Beyond wildlife, park officials began to understand that the land itself was changing. 
This early etching from when the Awanichis took care of the valley shows open meadows. They allowed natural fires and even set some themselves to maintain this meadow. Today, after more than 100 years of denying fire its natural role, you see a dense forest, an unnatural state primed for a dangerous fire. Park management philosophy has come full circle. Officials have begun to incorporate the techniques of the Awanichis with the visions of the park's first champions. When we come back, the traditions of the Awanichi are still alive in Yosemite. And now back to Yosemite, preserving the wild with Lee Majors. Yosemite has a rich history of Native American culture, including that of the Awanichi people, who settled here nearly eight centuries ago. Never a large population, they endured tribal wars, disease, and eventually attacks by non-Indians. Their descendants still live in Yosemite and the surrounding area. While in Yosemite, you can experience their living culture at the Awanichi Indian Village. The village contains a variety of traditional Awanichi structures that would have stood in Yosemite Valley centuries ago. Visitors are welcome to explore most of them. The smallest structure, called the Umacha, is made up of bark and at one time was used as a home. The chief would have lived in this more modern house that could fit a number of people, but the most important structure is one that is still used today. Now this here is our, what we call our ceremonial roundhouse, and it's used for various functions or purposes, and we call it a hangy and it's for traditional dancing, uh, social functions, talks, and so it's, it's our church, like mm -hmm. a church on the outside. Mm -hmm. You mind if I take a look? The roundhouse is a sacred place for the many Awanichi ceremonies held throughout the year, and they ask that visitors only observe it from the outside. We are not able to use the land like we did, you know, over a hundred years ago. Uh, but today we are fortunate to use, you know, parts of the, of the valley, the village, and other parts for our ceremonies. As the tribe's spiritual leader, Jay Johnson is empowered to oversee traditional ceremonies. Many of these involve the black bear, a spiritual guide for the Awanichis. Well, the bears, we were told by our elders, and it comes down to us today that that they were all related, they're our relatives. And today, we call ourselves the bear people of Yosemite. And we use the bear spirit of the, of the valley uh, in our ceremonies. It's very important to us. The bear is represented in many sacred objects the Awanichis use in their ceremonies. Right on the inside here is, is, uh, is two uh, what we call paintings. Uh, one is uh, the bear on the left and uh, the man print on the right. Uh, these are supposedly footprints. And these are actually uh, taken from the, the pictographs that are, that are in uh, one of the ancient villages uh, to the north of us in a big canyon. Several ceremonies during the year relate to the bear. In June, we have our, what we call our main bear ceremony. Uh, it's the uh, third weekend in June. We have, have it here, right here, in the ceremonial house. The bears, they do their dance. Uh, we do our talks, our singing, our prayers, and it's all for the people. Uh, besides ourselves, our families, uh, we're doing this for the people to bring good health, uh, healing, uh, better understanding uh, to all of our people, not only to the Indian people, to the non-Indian people as well. The village is a place where many can share a unique cultural tradition. You can get involved in scheduled events or take a walk along a self-guided trail. So arrows were retrieved and used again whenever possible. Jay's son, Philip, works as a cultural interpreter in the village and demonstrates traditional skills to visitors. 
The deer antler was the primary tool for uh, chipping and flaking the obsidian into the points. Uh, usually a piece of leather uh, is held in the hand so that uh, the maker does not get cut. And by using the very tip of the antler to work the edges of the piece, holding it firmly in the hand, and the idea was to apply some pressure and chipping off the flakes as needed. Philip is also a lead singer and dancer in the ceremonies. Julia Parker, who's part Miwok, part Kashaya Pomo, has dedicated her life to carrying on the traditions of the Awanichis, especially basket weaving. I came in here 48 years ago, intermarried with the people here, and then um, begin to learn the story, their story of how they lived in the valley and how they built baskets to carry their infants in. And my first basket was a cradle board given to me by my husband's grandmother. Julia learned her skill from Lucy Tellez, an Awanichi master basket weaver. Julia continues to pass her knowledge down through the family so that one day, her great-granddaughter will be able to keep alive some of the old ways. First of all, when, when we come to our plants and before we start to dig, we have to make an offering. Please, as we take from the earth, and thank you as we give back. So let's make an offering, and we're going to give the earth some acorns. So just throw them down in there like that. And then the plants will be happy that, that we're still using them and that we're learning how to find the root in the right way. Julia often sits outside mending old baskets or working on new ones. These are pieces that I've done um, years ago. They're all, they're really all beginning, um, what shall I say, learning pieces. Learning to put zigzags, diamonds, triangles, shape, you know, it, it's all, um, it's all uh, the only way that I can learn because I don't have any of the ladies sitting with me besides going into the museum and looking looking at the baskets in the museum. The museum plays a very important part, and it will play a more and more important part for us who are trying to, to uh, learn some of the stories or the ways or make tools that the old people did. The village's dual purpose, to serve both descendants and visitors, benefits everyone. Well, I think the visitors are becoming, you know, uh, more aware of our culture by us having our ceremonies here. And uh, we've been doing this for our own people, but also to create better understanding between other cultures and us. When I visited, I realized the traditions of the Awanichis are as much a part of Yosemite as the natural beauty, and without care could also be lost. Well, a big concern of ours and mine is that, you know, what does the future hold for us here in Yosemite? Uh, we've been having our ceremonies for over 20 years and we'd like to continue that, to have our ceremonies forever here in, in the valley. Jay expresses a sentiment that's true for all of us. The land is a very important part of our heritage here in our, you know, not only today, but forever, for all time, for generations to come. In a moment, they're beautiful, but dangerous. A closer look at Yosemite's black bear. Now back to Yosemite, preserving the wild with Lee Majors. Yosemite's wild beauty easily draws you in. Hiking or walking around the park will take you through breathtaking scenery, maybe even a chance encounter with mountain wildlife. Our job is I found a way you can enhance this experience. Take a walk with a park interpreter. They're trained naturalists who know Yosemite well. The park has always had this dilemma of two things. Uh, preservation and recreation. 
And so both are important, that's why they were set aside. However, if there's too much preservation, then the public can't get in to enjoy and see it. If there's uh, too much public and too many visitors, then they actually destroy the very scenery that is supposed to be preserved for them. Interpreters like Bob lead regularly scheduled walks several times a day. They act as links between visitors and the park. The more understanding you gain for Yosemite, the deeper appreciation you'll have for this land. Well, our job is to translate the beauty and the grandeur of a place like this into the experience of the people who come up to, to learn about these things and learning is only part of it because it leads on to appreciation, you know. Uh, the Park Service's main goal is to protect the scenery and the natural processes of the scenery in such a way that uh, the people and future generations will be able to appreciate a truly natural area. The Park Service is attempting to reverse many earlier mistakes and re-educate the public on how to interact in nature, something that's been forgotten. As part of this goal, they are striving for a more natural treatment of wildlife, one that requires your cooperation. I know it's very tempting to want to hand feed the animals, but you got to remember, this is their home. We're just passing through. And if we feed them, they'll become dependent on humans. You might think it's OK to just drop a few crumbs on the ground, but it's not. When you change an animal's natural behavior, you're jeopardizing its life. Hand-feeding wildlife was once an official park attraction. This relates specifically to the black bear. In the early years of the park, feeding stations were set up to lure bears, creating entertainment that then lured tourists. These feeding areas not only brought large numbers of bears unnaturally close together, but made them very comfortable with humans as well. This routine encouraged the bears to come into populated areas. Despite increased damage and injuries, the practice continued for decades. Only after hundreds of bears were destroyed to protect visitors did the Park Service end this form of entertainment. Today, the combination of people and bears still causes problems. Conditioned to find food near people, this is what a bear can do to a car to get a tuna fish sandwich. To protect both visitors and bears, the Park Service has become very strict about food storage. If you come to Yosemite to camp, you're required to take extra precaution to keep your food from bears. In fact, it's a federal offense to break food storage laws. You'll see warning signs posted all over the park, and believe me, these laws are for your protection. You can either buy or rent bear-proof food lockers. Backpackers are strongly encouraged to use them. Soon they'll be required in some backcountry areas. Despite rules and warnings, you never know the outcome of a chance meeting with one of Yosemite's inhabitants. The Park Service designed a management program to create the safest possible environment. Wildlife management in Yosemite means that we're trying to protect the populations of wildlife species in the park from the impacts of the humans here. And with four million vis visitors coming to the park every year, that's often a difficult task. Wildlife biologist Steve Thompson has to contend with visitors like me, who come to the park looking for bears. Yosemite does have a uh, reputation, you know. If I come here, am I guaranteed maybe to see a bear? Well, there are never any guarantees. It's always hit or miss whether you'll see a bear. But that's part of the adventure of viewing wildlife, is its unpredictability. Uh, but around here, you never know. You could get lucky. Well, if I get lucky and see a bear, what do I do? Well, we always emphasize to people that they are wild animals and that people should stay a safe distance away from them. A safe place in the valley for watching bears is Camp Curry. An old apple orchard in the parking lot attracts a lot of bears. In the fall, we do get apples on these historical apple trees here. 
and we do and in years where we have a heavy apple crop we can't have a large number of bears, bears in here usually in the evening if you look at this tree there you, you can see a lot of scratch marks on it from bears climbing up to get the apples uh, but we, even in these areas where bears are commonly encountered we emphasize to people they should stay away from the bears and let them forage naturally although they come to camp curry to find sweet apples they may get distracted along the way permanent tent cabins nearby sometimes offer enticing smells of food. We do get a lot of bears in here because there are a lot of people. They bring food with them. In this area? Oh yeah. They come down from the tailless slopes up above here, down into the campground areas. So Did they ever get into any of these tents? Oh yeah. They ripped right through them to the side of them. No <laughs> resistance at all. Often people say we have a bear problem here, but really it's more of a human problem. And by people allowing bears access to their food, the bears are altered in their behavior and become destructive and aggressive. So our primary goal is to remove these unnatural food sources that the bears have access to. If a bear continues to get human food, they often become very aggressive and destructive. And we will relocate those bears to more remote parts of the park in an effort to more or less rehabilitate them. But very often they come back to the same place where we caught them originally. And if they continue to get food, they become increasingly more aggressive and destructive. And sometimes we're forced to make the, the hard decision to kill a bear. In Yosemite, our behavior can directly affect the survival of a bear. Only if we act responsibly will these animals live as they were meant to, wild. In a moment, fire in Yosemite. And now back to Yosemite, preserving the wild with Lee Majors. To a visitor, fire raging in Yosemite may appear to be destroying the land, but fire is part of a natural process and one that should not always be controlled. Ranger Bob Roney spent years fighting fires for the Park Service. He now knows fire is part of life in Yosemite. Uh, here in Yosemite, fire does have uh, an important role in the ecosystem. It's, it's a very natural element. It's as natural as rain. Uh, the fires that we get here are started by lightning. Lightning accompanies uh, thunder showers that happen in the summer. It's perfectly natural. After nearly 100 years of putting out all fires, the Park Service realized burning the land is an important part in park preservation. Now the Park Service actually sets fires, and when lightning strikes, lets natural fires take their course. Fires are usually set in the fall. If you visit at this time, you might see warning signs. Portions of the park may be closed, but it should not affect your vacation. The fire may force you to rearrange your schedule, but remember, without it, the park is risking disaster. You can see here, there is layer upon layer upon layer of pine needles and uh, material that's come down out of the trees and the branches, sticks. This is, this is great tinder, burns really hot. And the fire gets in here, it starts burning some of the branch, lower branches on these trees. And you can see throughout this area that has not been burned for a long time, it's, it's like a ladder of fuel. And it, it, the fire burns to the little trees, to the medium trees, to the taller trees. And if it's hot enough, the whole place goes. It's, this is a bad place. Most of Yosemite has built up fuel, similar to this area. Without small natural fires to clear the fuel, it's only a matter of time before a huge destructive fire strikes. And that's just what happened in 1990. A lightning fire started and burned 24,000 acres before it could be brought under control. The charred forest left behind by such a fire can be disappointing to visitors. It would take a long time for this area to return to a living wilderness, perhaps generations. As destructive as uncontrolled fire is, nature will always find a way to renew itself. And one day, when Yosemite's buildup of debris is cleared, fire can again take up its traditional role. Fire has to be managed. In the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias, this means setting more fires. Otherwise, saving these rare trees might be impossible. I was walking around here earlier by myself, and I gotta tell you, Ranger Bob, it sure was pretty. Absolutely. 
The only thing is, you know, I gotta tell you, I was a personal witness to some of the most devastating fires in Southern California. And it seems to me that fires are just uh, uncontrollable. I mean, is it safe to burn around such rare trees? Well, actually, uh, back when this grove was first set aside as a, as a preserve, the pioneers thought, oh my God, we gotta protect these trees from the fires. They put out every fire that got anywhere near here. In fact, they even put fire hydrants throughout the grove so that they'd have readily accessible water. But as it turns out, these giant trees actually require fire for their survival. The sequoia cone is real small. And the seeds, let me knock some out here for you. The seeds are very tiny. And there's only enough energy in those seeds mm. for them to make sprouts about that tall. The sprouts have to get their roots in mineral soil. They have to get their leaves in light. If there has not been a fire, this ground is littered with pine needles and sticks and branches, sometimes six feet thick. Fire clears the brush and gives the tiny sequoia seedling a chance at life. When you visit the grove, you'll notice many of the trees have giant burn scars. Some of them go all the way through the tree, but the bark actually insulates the core from fire and allows the trees to survive. It's a good thing that we know better now, too. We might have lost these trees. Yeah, it'd be a shame to lose these babies. Sure would. Wow, look at this. I mean, all the way up. It's what I call a high rise. <laughs> it is a high rise for woodpeckers. <laughs> for the sequoia trees, fire hasn't been the biggest problem. People have. Before the turn of the century, three trees were tunneled to attract visitors. The most popular was the Wawona tunnel tree. In 1969, the Wawona tree finally fell, breaking into three long pieces. After living thousands of years, this over 200 foot high tree fell, less than 100 years after the tunnel was cut. Today, to protect the trees, you cannot drive in the grove. There are two ways to see them, by taking a tram ride or walking. But even on foot, you have to be careful. You know, these trees really are magnificent, and everyone wants to get a closer look. But after a million feet trample through, these giants are vulnerable. The roots are shallow and can be easily damaged. After a while, the trees just topple over. If you walk through the grove, keep your distance from the trees. That way, they will continue living and growing for another thousand years. When we come back, just how did those early visitors ever make it to Yosemite? And now back to Yosemite, preserving the wild with Lee Majors. When Yosemite Park was created, no one could have predicted its immense popularity. After all, it was nearly impossible to get here. Very few had ever heard of this remote valley in the High Sierras. In the late 1800s, artist portrayals of Yosemite began to appear across America. Some of these works were commissioned by early settlers who saw the commercial potential of promoting the area. These became, in effect, the first advertisements for the park, and they were successful. In 1855, 40 tourists braved the mountainous journey on horseback. By 1887, visitors could reach the outskirts of the park by rail. There they connected with a stagecoach for a three-day ride into the valley. Later, the automobile could cover the windy roads in much less time. In 1916, for the first time, more people came by car than train. The flood of visitors was unstoppable. Still, the drive to Yosemite was not easy. Cars at the time were not suited for the rough mountain roads. In 1926, the state of California opened an all-year highway, which stopped just short of Yosemite. This paved the way for more than half a million tourists to Yosemite annually. Soon after, a road connecting the highway to the valley toppled any remaining barriers. Modern tourism had begun. 
Today, Yosemite attracts people from all over the world. More than four million visitors arrive each year. So far, Yosemite has been able to survive with its beauty and wildness still intact. If we come here and use the park with knowledge and concern, we can still continue to enjoy it. You know, I really hate leaving, but I know someday I'll be back. Yosemite was the inspiration for our national park system, and it's here that we can learn how to enjoy and protect this precious heritage. I'm Lee Majors, and thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. If you'd like to plan a trip to Yosemite, here's some useful information. There are five entrances to the park, including Tioga Pass, Hetch Hetchy, Big Oak Flat, Arch Rock, and South Entrance. The three airports most convenient to Yosemite are Fresno, Merced, and San Francisco. Shuttle buses directly to the park are available from both the Merced and Fresno airports. From San Francisco, it's a four to four and a half hour drive to Yosemite on either Highway 140 or Highway 120. From Los Angeles, it's about six and a half hours to the south entrance. Yosemite is open year round. The Mariposa Grove of Giant Sequoias closes in winter. Tioga Road, vehicle access to the high country, closes after the first snow. Glacier Point Road also closes after the first snow. Waterfalls are most spectacular in spring, and on early spring nights, dipping temperatures actually turns the water to snow. Rivers and lakes are low to dry by late fall. Yosemite is a high altitude environment with dramatic ranges in temperatures. In winter, temperatures range from 26 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. In spring, 31 to 73 degrees. In summer, nights can dip to a cool 48 while reaching in the 90s during the day. Fall is the most comfortable time of year, ranging from 39 to 74 degrees. The following phone numbers will help you get more information concerning Yosemite. Many are not toll free, so you'll be charged for the call. For general information about the park, call 209-372-0200. If you need information on road and weather conditions, call 209-372-0209. For hotel accommodations, call 209-252-4848. Camping reservations can be made by calling 1-800-436-7275. You need a wilderness permit if you want to backpack in the high country. For more information, call 209-372-0740.